Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode in the archives. Before we get started, I have a quick favor to ask of you. Okay, you think they're gone? You know, the people who just fast forward through the intro? Sometimes I wonder if anyone actually listens to this. Like, maybe I should just do some sort of secret giveaway. Anyway, if you're still listening, you probably know we're gearing up for our next season, and so I'd love to know who you'd like me to interview. So shoot me a note on Twitter or LinkedIn, or leave a comment on our YouTube channel. Thanks. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein, and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In July 2020, I interviewed Cliff Asnes, co-founder of AQR. This was several months after he penned a perspective piece titled The Valuesburg Address, where he waxed poetic about the multi-year drawdown in the value factor. Nearly three years later, he recently wrote the perspective piece, The Bubble Has Not Popped. I say wrote, but it's really just a single image of the value spread between growth and value, adjusted for just about every possible noise factor that you can imagine. The spread still hovers near generational highs. This isn't Cliff's first value drawdown. While never easy, I suspect his past experience at least makes it a bit easier. In this archive clip, I wanted to highlight the wisdom of experience. To me, that entails understanding what you know, what you wish you could know, and what you believe. I hope you enjoy. I want to start back at the beginning with you, back when you launched AQR, very famously, right in the teeth of the dot-com bubble. And if my facts are correct, I think you guys were sort of a target 20% vol fund, very quickly having two standard deviation type sell-off, which is a pretty meaningful drawdown in real drawdown terms, but ultimately proven right when you came out the other side. I am a big believer that people's experiences ultimately shape, especially formative experiences, ultimately shape their actions later on. As you sort of look back at that early history and the success you had sticking with your strategy, how much do you think that informs your mentality of just clinging to systematic strategies with, and to quote you, this clinging to them like grim death? It was a little bit north of 20% vol, which was an error, by the way. When we were at Goldman Sachs, and people always refer to us as hedge fund, and I'm always like, today, it's something like half or more than half our assets are traditional benchmark. At Goldman Sachs, it was like six-sevenths of our assets. But it turns out that a whole bunch of 20 and 30-somethings starting a traditional asset manager, you're told, come back when you're old. When you say, we're starting a hedge fund and we're closing, people back then were like, we're in. So it was kind of the path of least resistance. We did basically a similar thing at Goldman. We ran one very aggressive fund. Here's where I was a complete idiot. In going around to raise money in the first six months, I must have had 20 clients say, we don't need 22% vol uncorrelated to the market. How about you do a quarter of that? And I responded in a flip. I know you find this hard to believe, but with a flip tone, you want a quarter of the vol, give us a quarter of the money. And I still refused to admit I was wrong about the math because I was not, but I was staggeringly wrong. Because it turns out, Corey, this will shock you, that down two standard deviations at 20% upsets people more than down two standard deviations at 5%. And the kind of odd part is it really shouldn't. The statistical event is a statistical event. If you gave someone a quarter of the money because they were more aggressive, you lost the same amount of money. Math is on my side. But having served on many an investment committee since then, we do not call in the largest standard deviation event. We call in the idiots who are down 35%. And it's just how the world works. So it is an apropos question also now because history doesn't repeat, but it does rhyme. It does feel like we're in a very similar time to maybe uh, late 99, early 2000. 
We did start in August of 1998. I think of the tech bubble as really taking off after LTCM collapsed, starting in September of 98. Ironically, we were thrilled our first month because a lot of people didn't distinguish between us and LTCM. And I'm big fans of some of those guys individually. And I don't mean to be ex post about that, but we knew we were doing different stuff than them. So we were up in August when markets were down 22% and LTCM began. It was kind of a three-month end game. And so we were like, oh my God, proof of concept. Not that a month can be a proof, but a nice baptism to begin with. And we smiled too quickly, as anyone in markets always does, because the next 18 of our first 19 months, we didn't lose money every month, but we lost a lot of money, particularly because of what's still a big part of our process, the value factor, a very similar period. You know this, we're far from just value investors, though it does look like we're value investors when value has giant standard deviation events. Just like in early 2009, when the markets reversed and momentum got crushed, you look more like a momentum investor. I bring up all these bad things. It makes it sound like it never works. It has worked over the long period very well. But whenever extremes happen, you tend to look like that. We did stick with it, but very similar to today, we spent a ton of time, I hope with an open mind, saying, might we be wrong? We were the first back then to do this thing that people all casually refer to as the value spread. Like a lot of terminology, I don't think we use that term. We may have, but I don't think we used it in the in the paper. Very similar to stuff I've written now, the paper's data ended in November of 99. And I remember three months later presenting, because our conclusion was cheap versus expensive. We were at great extremes. Things were very cheap and very expensive, higher than any time in history. The three-year going forward prospects for value were very good. And three months later, I had to say, no paper has ever been this wrong this quickly. The paper, thankfully, we did forecast three-year horizons. And it was dramatically right when it all played out from the time we wrote the paper. But We all know being right and surviving are not always the same thing. We did learn, even shudder to say we'd learned a lesson. I think if you asked us before, do you have a five sharp ratio? We'd say no. We have a a good sharp ratio. Call it one for want of a nicer round number. We often say if it's above 0.5 in an uncorrelated process, everyone would want that. In the portfolio, the market's not a 0.5 sharp rate, it's about a 0.4 sharp ratio. If you could find another stock market uncorrelated, which you you can find other stock markets, but they're pretty correlated to the US, find another one uncorrelated with the same risk premium, you'd be excited. Having said that, you take a 0.5 to 1 sharp ratio itself in a normally distributed world has tremendously bad periods. In the actual world, which is certainly fat-tailed, everything has, I remember, fourth quarter of 96, and I'm dating myself a bit here, literally, it was better. It was a positive four standard deviation quarter. We've seen negatives. We've never seen 10s or 20s. Uh, I don't think we will. I don't think it is. I don't want to beat on LTCM, but I don't think it's that kind of an issue. But anyone who is in finance who doesn't think the world is somewhat fat-tailed hasn't been paying any attention. You may have noticed I've had a little bit of a Twitter fight with someone who seems to think that we don't know the world is fat-tailed. That particular fight is about whether it's priced into options enough. But my dissertation advisor, Gene Fama, called with Ken French, I believe his dissertation on the market being fat-tailed, that was at shorter horizons. So we've known that forever. So you sit on top of a modest, but we think real, sharp ratio. You got to think it's real. And then your job really becomes to defend it, stick with it, and realize that sharp ratio over the long term. And that is just far harder. So I don't think before 99, we would have said something dramatically different in terms of the facts, but a lesson on how hard it is to stick with something that you absolutely believe is true and real, not just for clients, but even for you. That lesson. And I guess having seen it be successful, and we had a, it was a different set of circumstances, but a similar experience with convertible arbitrage and value for part of the GFC. A lot of things were fine in the GFC, but those two were not, and we stuck with them. They looked super cheap, and again, came back. So experiencing that a few times, 
makes sticking with it like grim death harder. But you also have to acknowledge it can bias you the other way, too. Maybe this time is different. I think 99 out of 100 times the world has not changed as much as people think. But that doesn't mean one out of 100 it does. And if you've been successful fighting that, maybe you're too stubborn. So we try to fight that, too. We try to examine all this stuff with as open a mind as we can. I later found out this wasn't her quote, which was disappointing. But the first place I heard this was my Nebraskan mother-in-law who said an open mind is a great thing but not so open that your brains fall out. And I don't even know who said it, but I think she got it from somewhere, but it was perfectly applied. And that's kind of what you got to do with an investment process. You can't have your mind so open to every new idea that you're willing to trash what has worked for 200 years and for you for 20 years because it's not done well for a while. That's way too open. But if you swear that you're legally and morally entitled to the value premium, for eternity. No. And I don't know if I actually answered the question, but I talked for 11 minutes. So I'm I'm filibustering your podcast. That's perfect. It actually kind of nicely leads into my next question, because you're talking about this concept of having an open mind, evolving your thinking over time through these experiences. I'm always curious with people who have been in this industry for a while. If you had the opportunity to go back to when you started AQR, Get in a time machine, go back, pull yourself aside. Don't create any time travel effects and issues like we, we would expect. But you could just say something to yourself, whether it's a sentence or two, and give yourself a piece of advice, maybe other than, hey, invest in growth for the next 12 months. What would it be? It's funny. I ask myself those questions too, and, and I can see you're struggling with it too, because you have to answer in a realistic way. Go back and give me the Wall Street Journal every day for the next 10 years. It's not a fair answer. I probably would still have a lower sharp ratio than Jim Simons, but it would be pretty good. You know, I'll get philosophical here. I would like to tell myself it's all going to be okay. Because if you're doing reasonable things in investing and you are sticking with them, it will be okay. This is why I'm somewhat biased not to change our minds easily. The only way to lose if you're right long term is to get too cute with what you're doing. Let's say there really is a value premium and a momentum premium and a a low vol premium, and they're absolutely true. If you jump around between them, if you try to time them, and you know we're, we're kind of famously reticent, but not absolutely unwilling to do this, but we don't like it. And one of my main reasons is you can take something that is absolutely, in the world, I just said it's absolutely true. So I, I've done so you can't do in investing. I've guaranteed long-term it will work, but only for the hypothesis. You've taken something guaranteed to work and you've introduced the possibility that it will not work for you because you will time it exactly wrong. So I would tell myself, I might even shorten it to calm down because that could apply to my non-investing life also and be even more useful. So stick with me on this question. It's a little bit morbid, but I'm really curious how you're going to answer it. So let's pretend for a moment you get to the end of your life and you meet St. Peter at the pearly gates. And he says, Cliff, thank you for your contributions to finance. Because you've done so much, you can ask any question you want about the markets. And I will tell you the eternal truth. What question do you ask? First, I do like your odd assumption that a quantitative investment manager can go up, not down in this scenario. That's um, very kind of you. I have to hope. I mean, I'm in the same boat here. I'll give you two. One's about markets. One's a little more competitive in its nature. This is almost a throwaway, but we're never going to know how efficient the market is. I think it's certainly quite efficient in a long run horizon. I think it's rarely wildly inefficient. Even when I wrote my dissertation in Chicago, a big part of it was on price momentum. You've heard the joke. Gene Fama was great about it. He said, if it's in the data, write the paper. Uh, but I was terrified in telling him I wanted to write it unsuccessful. Momentum failing would have been a great Chicago dissertation. Momentum succeeding was difficult. But momentum is one of the harder ones to reconcile with efficient markets. People have certainly tried over the years. There are some theories. If you believe there's momentum to things, I think you're most of the way towards believing markets are at least not perfectly efficient. I should mention also Gene Fama won't tell you they're perfectly efficient. I sat through his class three times, once as a student and twice as a TA, just to make sure I kind of could answer the students' questions. And every year, 
He probably still does it. I haven't asked him in a while. He looks at the class at one point early and says markets are almost assuredly not efficient or not perfectly efficient. And you get guess. Only in Fama's class in Chicago could that statement elicit guess. He just says it's a point on a spectrum. Clearly, Gene thinks they're more efficient than most people. So I would like to ask St. Peter exactly to explain this one to me. I'm pretty convinced they're not the obvious. It's almost a tautology. They're not perfectly efficient. I'm pretty convinced. I wouldn't use the phrase irrational. I use the phrase less than perfectly rational. You and I both make errors on occasion. We both can do irrational things. I, I think we'd accept the verdict that we're not perfectly rational. I think we'd be insulted if someone called us irrational. That's a little bit different. So I'd like to ask St. Peter that. And then in a purely competitive way, this is odd. I'm, I'm working this out of my head as I'm asking this. I'd like to ask him, who are the best managers? Give me the top 10. But I have a very specific way I want to ask it. I want an ex ante. Everyone's had good or bad net luck in their life. And markets and this business is path dependent. So luck can matter a, a lot. But so St. Peter can answer ex ante. Maybe the person was a total failure because they took way too much risk early on. Who had ex ante the most, be they quantitative or, or not? And answer in a risk adjusted dollars sense. Uh, there are a fair amount of people, particularly in the hedge fund world, that get into these blanking contests over sharp ratio. Well, that's great. We want the highest sharp ratio we can get. But what's relevant is how many risk-adjusted dollars you can create for clients. Risk-adjusted means Jack Bogle did a tremendous thing, but us doing the same thing doesn't create wealth for clients, but a style that's not in their portfolio yet. So I've often thought about writing a piece. This would be dangerous to write right now because things... Uh, can get turned on you when things are not going so great, but an ode to low sharp ratio strategies. And when I say low, I mean, we want to make them as high as we can make them. The craftsmanship we talked about earlier, but value, particularly in large cap, not a huge edge. It's just an edge that's existed everywhere for a long, long, long time. And you can add a lot of dollars to portfolios because these things tend to be very, very, very high capacity. Uh, not infinite, nothing is, that's ridiculous, but certainly very high capacity. So I would like to know in that sense, risk-adjusted dollars. And clearly I'm altering the question to favor people like me a little bit by making it that sense, not sharp ratio. For the same amount of, say, risk or capacity, higher sharp ratio definitely adds to it, but both count. Who have been the best? I don't expect to be on this list. It's not an ego fest. But I'd be fascinated to know the ex-ante best managers ever in a risk-adjusted dollar sense. It might be surprising. You have done dozens of interviews, podcasts, talks, fireside chats, been asked probably hundreds of questions. What is the one question you wish someone would ask you but never has? I can't go with that St. Peter one? Nope. Got to be different. Because that was the question I didn't know I wished to be asked, but I did wish to be asked. The question I would like to be asked, all right, I'm going to cheat the question. I would like to be asked in 2023, oh my God, you made tons of money by sticking with that. Why was this not obvious to the whole world? I am looking forward to being asked that question, and I do believe I will be asked that question. And what's your answer going to be? My answer is it's way harder, and you sacrifice some of your internal organs to stick with this. And the end of your life comes 14 years earlier than it was supposed to. They don't hand you the risk premium. A great man once said, no pain, no premium. I hope you enjoyed this dive into the archives. If you did, leave us a rating or review and share with a friend. It helps us grow and it means the world. Thanks for listening.